Estevan Point on the ragged, remote west side of Vancouver Island. The light has been a beacon for sailors since 1909. June 20th, 1942, during the darkest moments of the Second World War, Estevan Point became a symbol of Canada's military vulnerability. According to official accounts afterwards, a Japanese submarine surfaced and fired about 20 shells at the light station. All missed the target, but struck a nerve in Canadian public opinion. For out there, beyond the war clouds lowering over the Pacific, lies militant Japan. The country was already in a fever over the threat of invasion from Japan. It was only six months after Pearl Harbor. Canadians nervously envisaged a similar sneak attack on British Columbia. Here, dropping sheer into the ocean amid miles of twisting inlets, the coastal ranges of the Canadian Rockies offer perfect concealment for submarines and raiders. Ottawa had already decreed the internment of Japanese Canadians, confiscation of their property, including their fishing boats. In Parliament, sensitive to military setbacks in Europe, pressure had put conscription on the front burner again, threatening a major political crisis. The shells that fell on Estevan Point were political manna from somewhere. Just where has long been a matter of controversy among West Coast lightkeepers like Donald Graham. Every person on the lights that I talked to had this conviction that it was a hoax. Atkinson Point Light in leafy West Vancouver. This is home for Donald Graham, a historian who's also been a lightkeeper for more than 15 years. A few years ago, he decided to write a history of West Coast lighthouses like his, but his research began to raise some troubling questions about the Estevan Point incident. When did you begin to share the skepticism about the official account of the shelling of Estevan Point? I didn't really be, uh, begin to share the skepticism until I, I managed to get documentary evidence that uh, made it quite clear that it was surface ships that shelled the stations. I mean, if if, if my analysis of the motive is correct, I mean, it's, it's, it's an extremely significant uh, point in Canadian history. Surface ship or submarine? His principal source for the startling claim that it wasn't a submarine, but a battleship, was none other than Robert Mike Lally, lightkeeper at Estevan Point. It was just before sunset, June 20th, one of the longest days of the year. Lally had just descended the tower. He looked seaward, saw a shocking sight, then ran back up the tower. This is how he described what he saw. Sighted warship on the horizon, southwest light, zigzagging under heavy smoke screen, time 9.25 p.m. Hostile warships shelled station, first shot marker, time 10 hours 14 minutes 30 seconds p.m. Observed flashes from hostile batteries on the horizon. The lighthouse was under attack. About two dozen shells landed that night, not one of them inflicting any damage. It was the first bombardment of Canadian soil since the War of 1812. Lally reported he saw three ships, a warship about eight miles out, a submarine about two miles from shore, and a small boat moving between them. He states clearly that shells came from the surface ship, an observation that was picked up in early press reports in BC. Time and again, he refers to shells coming from the hostile warship on the horizon. The only mention he makes of a submarine is that he describes uh, a white light moving from the uh, surface vessel towards the submarine. But interestingly enough, he doesn't describe the submarine as shelling the station at all. But by the time the incident had passed through official channels, the surface vessels had vanished, leaving only the submarine. The official version said, it is unlikely that a surface vessel was present during the bombardment. This bombardment was in all probability carried out by one submarine mounting 5.5-inch guns. 
There would be no contradiction for a long time. The page in the lighthouse log for that day mysteriously disappeared. The lightkeeper's war diary report vanished into the Ottawa bureaucracy, where it was hidden for more than 40 years. The official story of what happened out here the night of June 20th, 1942, eventually became a construct of distant observers, people with political and military reasons to shape the official record in a particular way. And they set it down with surprising certainty, especially surprising to people who actually saw and heard what happened out here that night. And the discrepancies have turned a bit of Canadian history into a bit of a mystery. And Dad worked on that, and that was his first job. Well, then his second job... He a mystery, that is, for everybody but a handful of eyewitnesses like Robert Lally Jr., the son of Lightkeeper Lally. He was in a boat nearby when the attack began. We were out fishing, and we, didn't, we knew there was something up. You could hear shells whistling and screaming and bursting, and you could hear the gunfire very clearly, as clearly as I hear your voice. Lally Jr. remains certain that the vessel that shelled Estevan Point was a warship and not a submarine. She was a warship because you could see her fighting top. You know, the, the, the conning tower and what they call it. Well, well, in the Navy, it's called the fighting top, you know. All warships have that. Of a surface vessel. Of a surface vessel. And of could, a large surface vessel. <laughs> and could you not see... Not a Corvette. Something like a destroyer or a cruiser? No, no, bigger than, bigger a, than, bigger than a destroyer. Oh, yeah, she was heavier than a destroyer. Destroyers had fighting tops, but certainly nothing as elaborate as that one. Yes. A lot of the people that lived there knew the truth. Mina Pete lived with her father, the lightkeeper at Nootka Sound, north of Estevan Point. She and her father watched the attack June 20th, 1942, and though she was only eight at the time, she remembers it vividly. And uh, Dad was by the window watching with his binoculars because it's night and dusk, and he always watched. And uh, that's when he spotted the boats. So you, take, you took your father's binoculars, you had a look, my dad said it was an aircraft carrier, a small aircraft carrier, a submarine, and a Japanese fish boat. I could see the three boats lined up in a row, and I could see people moving on them, and I could see these guns, and I could see three barrels, and in the flashes from the barrels as they fired, and then you could see the flash when they hit. Which of the ships was actually, from where you were, was actually shooting at the, the end. aircraft carrier was firing. Michael Whitby doesn't believe it. He's a historian with the Department of National Defense and has carefully researched the incident. What is the likelihood that a Japanese light cruiser could have got within eight miles of Estevan Point and shelled the lighthouse in June of 1942? Very, very, very slim. Uh, it would have to travel across the northern Pacific. American patrols out of the Aleutians, American patrols out of Midway, Canadian patrols out of the out of British Columbia, American patrols out of Washington State. Uh, be very, very difficult. Whitby believes that the Estevan Point Light was attacked by the Japanese submarine I-26. He bases that belief on a report compiled by American intelligence in Japan after the war. The Americans even trotted out a submarine commander after the war, Minoru Yakoda, who boasted that he directed the shelling of Estevan Point. I-25 and I-26 were dispatched to the northwestern North American coast in June 1942 to conduct fleet reconnaissance off Seattle. Uh, they arrived here on 7 June, they torpedoed one ship, on 19 June they torpedoed another. I-25 bombarded Fort Stevens on 21 June 1942. I-26 bombarded Estevan Point on 20 June 1942. They then headed home to their base via the illusions. That they, is in that report. That is in the re on the record. Yes. That is on the basis of fleet records from those, that period. Logs, re post-action reports, and operational orders. But the greatest force behind the official position is logical deduction. It couldn't have been a Japanese surface ship, so if it wasn't a Japanese surface ship, it had to be a hostile submarine. What else? 
Historian Donald Graham proposes a dramatic answer. The Americans shelled the lighthouse. Well, I believe that uh, an American service vessel and submarine rendezvoused off Estevan Point, fired about uh, 25 rounds under careful instructions to miss the tower but kick up enough of a fuss that a radio message would go out saying that the station was under attack, uh, then left. Who was the brain behind all that? I'm almost sure it would be Mackenzie King. And what did he have to gain? He had to gain what he's always, always wanted through his entire career, and that was political power. In June 1942, Mackenzie King was haunted by the conscription issue. In April, a national plebiscite had shown the country to be deeply divided, with Quebec passionately opposed to the draft. The split ran down the middle of cabinet, with English and French ministers on opposite sides of the line. You must understand the conscription crisis was far worse than anything we've ever faced since, including the constitutional crises of, of recent days. This was, this was a, a, a crisis which really did threaten to rip the country apart in a way that no one could have controlled. See, your theory is that this was cooked up in Ottawa with the connivance of Washington. Mm -hmm. Mackenzie King uh, got the Americans to shell the light station in order to ram the conscription amendments through Parliament and avoid the collapse of a wartime government, which would have been a disaster for the Allies. Mackenzie King was almost exultant in his diary entry for June 21st. Station was shelled last night, clear evidence of Japanese attack on the shores of Canada. It seemed to me that these events could not but have their effect on Canadian feeling with regard to conscripting men to be sent overseas. The Prime Minister read the national mood correctly. Within weeks of the Japanese submarine attack, conscription was the law of the land. And what about Lally's report? that a surface ship shelled Estevan Point. It was never made public, and the lightkeeper kept a discreet silence for the rest of his days. But silent or not, those careful observations recorded by the resolute lighthouse keeper June 20th, 1942, would eventually find other voices. Lightkeeper Lally's report, potentially as explosive as any of the shells that landed around him that night in 1942, eventually ended up here in the National Archives. When it came to light, decades later, official historians continued to brush it off. But our digging here reveals that Lally wasn't the only person to see a surface ship that night. A lot of people said they saw it, and the first investigators on the scene seemed to take them seriously. The morning after the shelling, four naval patrol vessels headed for Estevan Point. First to arrive was the Mulock. It landed a patrol to interview witnesses, and they came back with fragments of the shells that had landed the previous night, including a large piece of a shell casing which naval officers promptly whisked away. It has since disappeared. Also missing from the official accounts of the Estevan Point affair, References in the Mulock log like this one. Two people here definitely describe a light cruiser, others a submarine. And this statement from another ship's log, which, like Lally's diary, describes a ship eight miles offshore. People think they see things. I mean, how many times have we watched murder mysteries on TV and you have the police have four eyewitness accounts of what happened? They have to investigate them all. In history, you investigate them all. Historian Whitby is sticking with the official story. Estevan Point was shelled by a Japanese submarine, no matter what the people there think they saw. Well, how do you react to Robert Lally's account that it was a surface ship doing the shelling? Mr. Lally is under great stress. I mean, he's being fired at. Okay, it's the dark night. He doesn't have binoculars. He's, he's a very courageous, calm individual. One of the skippers said he was that. I agree with that. Uh, he's trying to identify something he says is eight to ten miles on the horizon, right directly behind the submarine that is firing. Uh, I wasn't there. Okay? I don't know what he saw, but the records do not substantiate the fact that there was a light cruiser there. My father was an honest man. He dealt the cards as they were and let them fall where they may. He made his report and that was it. 
My father was in the war of 1914 to 1918, from the very beginning to the very bitter end. That's that why there is no question about his war diary, which, of which I have copies here. He, he called for so many shells this way, so many shells that way. And no matter what the bureaucrats want to fool around with it or alter it or change it, it happened. I was there, you know. So obviously someone has to be lying, and it raises the question of motive. For Donald Graham, it boils down to a test of credibility, the war stories of a defeated Japanese submarine commander against the eyewitness account of a lightkeeper with nothing to gain from embellishing what he saw. What possible motive would Robert Lally have to imagine that the station is under attack by surface vessels? A lot of people, you know, who have probably a more a kinder, gentler view of uh, politics than you uh, might say, this is really, you know, this is really up there with conspiracy theories. <laughs> well, think about it. Um, the Americans got into a war with Spain because one of their battleships blew up in Havana Harbor, and they, we've since learned that it was probably an explosion in the coal bunker. It certainly wasn't the, the Cubans or the Spanish that did it. And uh, the Vietnam War, the Gulf of Tonkin was an incident which was fabricated in order to get Congress to virtually cede war-making powers to the president. The firm of Hill and Knowlton was hired to produce the Kuwaiti ambassador's daughter to say that she had seen Iraqi soldiers removing infants from incubators, and she wasn't even there. And uh, this is a trend, it's not a conspiracy. It's as old as uh, the slogan that truth is the first casualty of warfare. The shelling of Estevan Point. Quixotic flourish by a cheeky enemy? Or one of the most Machiavellian manipulations in Canadian history? There is one other totally objective witness, but it isn't talking. <laughs> 